Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, and welcome to this symposium entitled Global Ethnography 100 Years After the Argonauts. My name is Jukka Jouki and I'm the president of the Finnish Anthropological Society. But I also work here in the University of Turku for the Study of Cultures program, uh, which is uh, uh, our, our co-organizer. The idea for this symposium was born, I guess, about less than a year ago when we at the, on the board of the Finnish Anthropological Society sort of realized that Malinovsky's Argonauts was turning 100 years this year. And first we are uh, talking about arranging a, a, a panel discussion on, on Zoom but our appetites grew uh, and, uh, and uh, we were able to get funding. So now we were able to invite uh, distinguished anthropologists from around Finland and, and even from Trinidad and Tobago to talk about Malinovsky's uh, uh, legacy and, and particularly contemporary ethnography and how it has changed uh, in, in, in 100 years. I'm sure we all know Bronislav Malinovsky's work to some extent. Uh, we know that he was sort of um, one of the one of the uh, anthropologists who, who sort of took anthropology from the armchair into the cultures of of of, uh, of uh, our study, and since then. It has been the canon of, of anthropology and ethnographic work that we spend time with the people we are interested in and want to want to study and, and live among the people we are interested in and, and so on. But uh, times have changed and, and uh, a lot has happened during a hundred years. Uh, nowadays, we don't have to go halfway around the globe to do ethnography if, if you don't want to. We don't have to spend several years uh, in a location to, be, to understand a society. But perhaps more importantly uh, concerning this symposium, we have become more aware of all kinds of power configurations uh, uh, within ethnography. Uh, and it has a lot to do with the general uh, decolonization process in, in the humanities and, and social sciences. So that's what we are uh, going to discuss today, like what is ethnography today and, and what is left from the era of, of Malinovsky. And the schedule will be as follows. Uh, First, we will have a, a keynote presentation. <clears throat> then uh, we will break for lunch uh, already. After that, we were supposed to have three uh, guest speakers to present, but one had to cancel. But uh, fortunately, we were able to find a very interesting and beautiful and, and, uh, and uh, valuable short film that we would like to show you instead of a presentation. I'm sure you will like it. And after the uh, presentations, we will have a round table discussion on, on the legacy of, of Bronislav Malinowski and what it is to conduct ethnographic fieldwork today. But uh, uh, without further ado, I would like to invite uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Shelen. Gomes from uh, the University of the West Indies in Trinidad and Tobacco. She's uh, uh, obviously a, a professional ethnographer and she has uh, conducted research in, in many places, among them East Africa, where she has studied the Rastafaris and, and she has conducted research in Trinidad, where she's uh, um, been interested in in the unpaid uh, work of, uh, of care workers, women and uh, female care workers, workers. So yeah, please, the stage is yours. 
Thank you. You go. No need. No need. Thank you so much, Yuka, and thank you so much, colleagues. Um, and so I'm hoping today, thank you so much for this kind invitation as well, um, for me to be able to speak with um, colleagues and anthropologists working in multiple um, fields, but also across and uh, doing interdisciplinary work to talk a bit about some of these um, configurations of power that Yuka has mentioned that many, if not all of us are grappling with today as we try to do um, good ethnography and we try to do good anthropology. So I am very I'm honored and pleased um, to participate in these critical reflections and discussions on the present anthropological moment. So I'm going to read the text that I have. And I also have some accompanying slides that are kind of visual aids because, you know, in today's, um, today's era, we're all very focused on, uh, 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 rightly so, um, the visual as well as the written. Um, and so some of the slides that I'm using to kind of frame my remarks are basically to kind of introduce the sections that I have to talk about cosmopolitan imaginings and a Caribbean ecumeny and what I have provisionally titled toward counter perspectives on modernity. So uh, today what I would like to do is to make an argument um, in favor of ethnography. I don't seem to be able to, yes, perfect. <laughs> um, and so more precisely, um, it's in favor of an ethnographic mindset, uh, a way of thinking, a way of approaching the foundation of anthropological inquiry into the human condition, an organized inquiry into the complexity of people in the many places they find themselves and in which human beings make meaning within many worlds. So to help this argument, I draw a great deal upon the cosmopolitan imaginings of Pan-Africanist Caribbean Rastafari. Um, and I do this in order to situate some of these power configurations within anthropology um, of the 21st century and to help us reflect on doing ethnography over the past 100 years. And to give a, um, a bit of context to this, in the mid to late 20th century, some Rastafarians made the conscious decision to move to Jamaica and elsewhere, um, to move from Jamaica, sorry, and elsewhere to Shashamane, Ethiopia in search of betterment. And so in my view, it's not so much of an argumentative stretch to say that this group sought to realize the promises of the modern, of the major modern revolutions, searching for and making equality on both sides of the Atlantic, um, not only on one side, so my efforts to understand betterment in historical, spiritual, and materialist terms, and the mindset that set Rastafari in motion, both imaginatively and bodily, um, is one part of my argument, uh, that there is an emancipatory potential to the ethnographic mindset, um, especially when it highlights how current localized scenarios are interconnected with global processes and how these have been centuries in the making. So in my work, um, I'm sort of preaching to the choir here because I don't think I need to say how valuable this ethnographic mindset is, um, but I would like to offer a few comments from my work. Um, I have tried to use the ethnographic mindset to better understand the imaginative responses to the inequalities of the modern era by everyday people in the global South. And so this way of thinking is worthy of consideration because it keeps anthropology alive. And which I see as valuable. And of course, it helps to keep our jobs as anthropologists. Um, it encourages people though, um, more importantly, to cultivate empathy and to cultivate sympathy, to cultivate respect for difference. So not simply to um, close ranks. Um, and it also helps people to um, cultivate an understanding of the various predicaments that shape ways of living thereby questioning norms and values. So um, I'm going to start off with a quote from Sidney Mintz, a Caribbean uh, anthropologist, a Caribbeanist anthropologist located in the global north, but one of the anthropologists I keep coming back to because in his 1994 Huxley Memorial Lecture, 
Mintz asked the audience to consider which kinds of categories can serve useful classificatory anthropological purposes. And to me, this is a question that all anthropologists are likely to consider in our work. Uh, while critically reflecting on the epistemological and teleological matter surrounding these categories and classifications. And so I hope to show how present inequalities reflect how patterns from the 16th to the 19th centuries are still present in the 21st century. And some categories and some relations traverse centuries, some span locations and cultures. And this is one enduring reverberation of modernity. And so I ask uh, this question here, um, can the ethnographic mindset be part of a radical reimagination of what life could be like in the places of the global South and the places to which they are connected? For this reason, I will end by offering some thoughts about decolonization from the vantage point of Caribbeanist anthropology and ethnographies of the Caribbean. And I hope this kind of sets um, the stage for some of the discussions that we will be having later on uh, this uh, later on today. So to talk about a uh, Caribbean ecumeny, I think it's a bit important. I think it is quite important um, actually to introduce and to kind of um, reinvigorate this idea because of its value for anthropology and for ethnography at present. While the bulk of my fieldwork took place in Ethiopia, I consider myself a Caribbeanist anthropologist. And in an era when area studies have been aptly critiqued, in my view, it still makes sense to categorize myself and my field of study in this way. It signals for me how the Caribbean came to be made through movement of all kinds, but also the place of the Caribbean in modernity. And in highlighting the role of this region in forming the modern world, Sidney Mintz refers to the human tides of labor importation through the transatlantic slave trade. These were among the most massive demographic and acculturational phenomenon in world history. The time scale matters, Mintz writes. They were over by the time Victoria was crowned Empress of India and mostly before West Africa became colonial. There were, of course, other labor schemes to serve the West Indian colonies, such as Asian indentureship um, that went on until the 20th century. But such a reference is not meant to neglect pre-colonial indigenous or Amerindian movements, but to demonstrate how the Caribbean was made part of the anthropological world on terms other than those defined by its Aboriginal past. And this is one of the key points that I'd like us to think about um, today when we're thinking about the value of an ethnographic mindset and situating that within um, 21st century anthropology and offering the remarks that I offer today on Caribbeanist anthropology. So here I think Caribbeanist anthropology is a useful reference point in expanding the anthropological definition of a culture era, a culture era area, sorry. So relatively late to anthropology, precisely for this reason, uh, a particular combination of processes incorporating into those new life ways attitudes about individuality, about the nature of human relations and about the significance of cultural differences brought unique results, Mintz continues. And this was the basis for a Caribbean ecumene or culture area. And Mintz continues, I put in um, quite a, a significant quote uh, because he argues that this basis lies with the social frameworks created for culturally diverse migrant peoples who were subjected to centuries long processes of mostly forced cultural change by European rulers and with the long-term effects of these processes upon Caribbean life. And so Mintz adds that this culture area has nothing to do with language or food or dress or like cultural indices as such, some of the things that are ostensibly uh, culture, right? But with the transmuted vision of the world itself engrafted upon countless strangers who came or were brought to the region over centuries replacing those who had died or who had been killed off by disease, 
war and European imperial enterprise. So Caribbean area studies, therefore, are global in scope. And it is uh, attentive to an industrially and socioculturally modern region that incorporates more than the well-researched recent 20th century labor migrations of Caribbeans from the global south to the global north, but people who have and continue to traverse across the south, challenging processes set in motion centuries ago. And as a small point of clarification, I wanted to say that I use the term global south as an analytical category that is attentive to the ordering of the world during modern capitalism in particular. It's not meant to ally the heterogeneity and the specificities within and across former European colonies. While there has been significant political, economic restructuring and cultural change uh, following political decolonization, with neo-imperialism and globalization at play, there are colonial metropole patterns uh, that shape worldviews and everyday life to a large degree at present. Okay. Um, that was kind of, you know, hoping to get to there. <laughs> Um, so what I'd like to do now is to go into some stories of um, Shashamani life. Uh, here on this slide, I've simply put in a quote, a very well-known quote from uh, a Caribbean Trinidadian philosopher, C.L.R. James, from the Black Jacobins, because in the Black Jacobins, basically uh, the Black Jacobins, Toussaint Louverture and the Sandemang, sorry, and the Haitian Revolution, um, James basically talks about how it was the Haitian Revolution and the imagination of people who were in conditions um, of oppression and who were subordinated that actually realized the enlightenment ideals, right? Of equality, um, of liberty, equality, and fraternity. And so it was only when this revolution happened on the other side of the Atlantic um, that, these, that these sorts of promises of, uh, of the enlightenment were realized. So, um, to go back to these stories of Shashmane life that I think are valuable to share, about a decade ago, um, it's <laughs> about a decade ago now, um, I started doing field work in Ethiopia. And unfortunately, with COVID and um, since moving to um, Trinidad, also after teaching in Ethiopia for a few years, I have not um, been back in Shashmane. Um, but about a decade ago in his yard in Ethiopia, Brother David and I were having a conversation about how his spirituality shaped um, his Rastafari identity. So we were sitting um, in his yard, as I mentioned, um, in the Jamaica Safar, which transliterally Jamaica Safar means Jamaica neighborhood. And this neighborhood is also referred to as Rasta Safar. Um, so Rasta Safar, Jamaica Safar, um, transliterally simply means the neighborhood where you find a lot of Jamaicans, quote unquote, who are not all from Jamaica and Rastafari in the Southern Ethiopian city of Shashmani. So during the conversation, uh, brother David turned to me and he said, quite simply, I am Ethiopian, just like my neighbor who was born and grew here. Um, and in a kind of combination of standard English and Jamaican Patois. And so Brother David is a Jamaican-born Rastafari man, now in his 60s. Uh, at that time, he was in his 50s. And so to some, this may read as an inaccurate or a very odd statement. But even though Brother David has spent more of his life in Ethiopia than in Jamaica, there were many Ethiopians who believe his self-designation as Ethiopian, quote unquote, might read as an insincere masking of his imposition that comes from a foreign birth. It doesn't matter that Brother David has raised his children and built a life in the Jamaica Safar, just like his Ethiopian Orthodox Christian neighbor or his um, Muslim neighbor on the other side, for example. To some Ethiopians, um, as a group, as a population whom I refer to in my ethnographic work as local Ethiopians, his presence was an imposition. But from a Rastafari perspective, Brother David's statement is an existential one. It reflects a Rastafari reimagination of self as African and as Ethiopian, as a human being fashioned in the image of the Rastafari designated Ethiopian creator, his Imperial Majesty Emperor Haile Selassie I. 
And for Brother David, it reflects his own validation as a Rasta man who has achieved his goal of repatriating, quote unquote, to Ethiopia, because these are his words. So these remarks that I've, I've um, prefaced the section with about placemaking and belonging, as well as the struggles they bring about, provide what I hope is an aperture for the central motif of my remarks today. The role of imagination within the ethnographic mindset and its potential for more just and fair social relations through betterment. And it is important to recognize that the journey that Brother David and a few Rastafari like him had made, who had come to Shoshmani, was a repatriation, as I said. Um, it was a repatriation to the spiritual birthplace of Ethiopia. It wasn't a literal repatriation, nor was it the repatriation of. Um, for example, uh, persons who are categorized as illegal migrants or undocumented migrants, um, and those who are repatriated um, to places of birth or homelands from which they have um, from which they have journeyed. For Rastafari, following collective histories of African enslavement and forcible removal from home centuries ago. Legal emancipation and political decolonization, all of these things have happened, certainly in the British West Indies uh, 150 years ago. Um, and the political decolonization uh, about 60, 70 years ago. The Rastafari journey is now to return to this place reimagined as, as home. And this place is Ethiopia. So migration to Ethiopia is therefore a spiritual repatriation that is not based upon codified or institutionalized belonging to place and culture, but one that is grounded in a reimagined personhood. And so through this complex of reimagination, migration as repatriation and ideals of home and belonging, Rastafari cosmology and worldview evince what I have referred to as a Caribbean cosmopolitan sensibility. As one example of cosmopolitanism from the global south, I provisionally have defined this as a proclivity for imaginative reinvention in line with ideals of equality. And there are examples, for example, uh, from the Haitian Revolution that we can see. So I will uh, expand on that point uh, shortly, but to provide some background um, to this Rastafari spiritual repatriation to Ethiopia and specifically to Shashamane, Ethiopia, decades prior to Brother David's 1975 repatriation, uh, following the 1930 coronation of Rastafari Makonan as his Imperial Majesty Emperor Haile Selassie I in Ethiopia, everyday Black men and women, subjects of the British Empire in Jamaica, 12,000 kilometers away, reimagined themselves as Ethiopians. Um, and in doing so, they reimagined themselves as human beings, um, as equal human beings, um, modeled in the image of this Rastafari designated God. So watching newsreel footage, reading magazines, exchanging correspondence, um, and exchanging correspondence with people who were traveling around the world as well, um, comrades, friends, church fellows, these global, or what we would call today global networks, um, helped many Black subjects in colonial Jamaica in 1930 to see a Black king. And they had never seen that before. And so they tried to find out as much as they could about Ethiopia. This potent symbolism of Africa was captured by Marcus Garvey, himself not a Rastafari, very critical uh, um, of Rastafari, but a Pan-Africanist um, in his play, The Coronation of the King and Queen of Africa. And so these plays were put on in colonial Jamaica and creating this West Indian god um, quote, unquote, as historian Robert Hill has dubbed Haile Selassie I, um, after whom they named themselves, Rastafari looked to Ethiopia, even while Ethiopia was a monarchy, as a rejection of the systemic hierarchies of racial capitalism and the kinds of legacies and everyday experiences that they were having in colonial Jamaica. So shortly thereafter, Emperor Haile Selassie's um, speech at the League of Nations appealing for support following the Italian invasion of 1935 and his subsequent visit um, to Jamaica in 1966 reinvigorated Rastafari efforts to repatriate to Africa as well as their anti-colonial activity. 
And, and so this declaration of belonging to Ethiopia overturned an imperial ethnocentric concept of the African as inferior to the, to the European and as worthless notions that were legitimated through Christian doctrine. And it was that knowledge of the Christian Bible. And this is one of the things that I think Caribbean um, anthropology and ethnographies of the Caribbean can help us recognize, that it was through the knowledge of the Christian Bible. Uh, it is through the, the doctrine at hand that Rastafari, that subordinated groups and subjugated peoples are able to reimagine themselves in conditions of freedom and to actually do something about it in this case. Um, spiritual repatriating to Ethiopia. So it was that knowledge of the Christian Bible that Rastafari enjoined with West African derived religious practices um, that had survived the Middle Passage as well. And so certainly I concur with other anthropologists who situate Rastafarianism as an outgrowth of beliefs and rituals from West Africa brought and syncretized during slavery. Um, brought and syncretized in the New World, in this case, um, in the colonial West Indies. But I differ in, uh, in my view that it is a syncretic, um, necessarily. Um, it, it is syncretic in the sense that it also incorporates um, significant aspects of Christianity uh, that Rastafari used um, to their advantage. And so uh, a lot of the schools that were opened in the early 20th century in Jamaica and other breast, uh, sorry, British West Indian colonies founded mainly by religious organizations had become known to, to ordinary people and they had become accessible to ordinary people. So learning about the Bible and Bible studies and learning about Christian doctrine became part um, of your schooling and it also became part of everyday life by the time we get to the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, certainly in colonial Jamaica. And so the historical circumstances in which collective enslaved gatherings were prohibited, but later permitted with coerced Christian conversion in the colonial West Indies, meant that religion became a collective means of challenging Eurocentric institutions. And there's a long line of, of ethnographic and anthropological literature speaking to that. So political response to white domination, and this is one of the reasons that I talk about uh, Rastafari cosmopolitics in the next section, political response in this time took the form of mass secular organization. Um, and it may not have been ostensibly um, political through systems that existed, but it was through a reinterpretation of doctrines at hand. And this reinterpretation was an early syncretic attempt to decolonize Christian practices. And the latter had supported systemic white supremacy in the Caribbean. So within this framework, Rastafari challenged white supremacy by embracing a common humanity of equal rights and privileges, but it is also a common humanity that is separated by those who are in the faith, those who are Rastafari, and those who have not manifested or become Rastafari, like myself, as the common saying goes. So this view recognizes that there is a good deal of in internal differentiation within this common world humanity. But it is also an inclusive world community of those who have been subordinated and marginalized. So this response to the legacies of modernity can be construed as a cosmopolitanism from the global south, I argue, that adheres to an aesthetic and intellectual openness to a divergent cultural experiences, uh, to quote Ulf Hanertz. And for Rastafari, openness is grounded in a historical awareness of Caribbean sociality made out of the transcontinental plantation economy, its hierarchies, its multicultural environment, and imaginative acts of self-fashioning. So um, I have a bit more um, of the details and what I call the, the background, the emergence um, of Rastafari cosmology and worldview. But I think um, in the interest of time, I might try to condense it a bit. So in keeping with this biblical imagery and influence, Ethiopia was Zion or heaven on earth and the West and the Caribbean then were Babylon, a proverbial hell. 
Babylon became analogous to systems of oppression and how these were propped up by the legacies and institutions of bourgeois civilization, to use an, an old kind of Marxist term. So inclusive of the church and schools, the education system, for example, was called in Rastafari speech, the hedication system, um, making epistemological and teleological connections regarding which worldviews and knowledges were privileged and what was taught and for whose benefit. So this hedication, this kind of um, analysis um, it, it can be likened as well to um, ideology, right? To Gramscian ideology. And so like many Rastafari repatriates in Ethiopia who were born and raised in the Caribbean, Brother David also situated his experiences within these circumstances in colonial Jamaica. He wasn't around in the 1930s, but he was around in the 1950s. And he was also around in Jamaica up until the 1970s, when Jamaica had become politically independent, um, which led to his identification of Rastafari, a period which saw rapid urbanization and labor migration abroad, as in many um, British West Indian territories and also many independent Caribbean countries. So thousands of rural Jamaicans were displaced by the government um, to build bauxite factories, right? And these were part of the modernization programs that were introduced in much of the former colonies, um, were either relocated to the urban slums that had sprung up and surrounded Kingston, or they were packed onto the so-called banana boats that carried agricultural produce to the United Kingdom. So in this social turbulence of colonial Jamaica, Rastafari meetings also provided a haven for the poor and the dispossessed to enact verbal resistance and sometimes physical resistance against the local elite, inclusive of the police force, politicians and businesses. And this was a, and this was a local elite in independent Jamaica constituted of black and brown Jamaicans. So it was precisely because of these critiques of the local bourgeoisie that Rastafari were hunted, as they say, and as they repeat today in 21st century Shoshmane, on the eve of decolonization. And they were also hunted, as they say, after decolonization. So this kind of persecution continued into the independence era under the governance of the new, of the new elite, as I mentioned. Rastafari were dispossessed, they were assaulted, they were arrested, they were jailed or locked up. Um, they had their dreadlocks forcibly um, cut. Um, and the, because dreadlocks had become symbolic of militant resistance to order and civilization in post-colonial Jamaica. And this wasn't colonial Jamaica any longer, um, or certainly not politically. Um, as Brother Lewis, another repatriate in Shashamani, bluntly remarked um, at the time, it, had he stayed in Kingston, he said, had he stayed in Kingston, Jamaica, his childhood home, he would have likely been dead. It, having moved to Shashamani, he survived. And so with this collective consciousness, um, is while this collective consciousness, sorry, is reproduced within the Rastafari community in Shashamani, in my work, I also demonstrate how individual first and second generation Rastafari craft distinct self identities as well as malleable ideas of belonging. Um, and that's something we can always speak about a bit more later on. Consequently, Rastafari cosmopolitanism cannot simply be reduced to humanism. It is the spiritual grounding of Rastafari and the political religious interconnections that coalesce in what Rastafari call consciousness. And so this emic term of consciousness is a consciousness of unequal freedoms. Um, and this consciousness of unequal freedoms was and continues to be rooted in all of these kinds, in this kind of knowledge and this kind of collective memory of oppression, exploitation, landlessness, underemployment, and other effects of colonialism. It is in fact um, the unequal, of unequal modernity. And so the hierarchies that are felt and, and are institutionalized every day. So positioning themselves as one of many oppressed globally, Rastafari likened their conditions to Palestinians under Israeli occupation, for example, and they continue to do so today, um, or black South Africans under the past apartheid. 
Rastafari also recognized that systems of oppression and therefore experiences of inequality were shared around the world. And so they were, there were, there are um, these discursive attempts at solidarity that are at the core, I argue, of Rastafari cosmology and worldview. But Rastafari themselves were by no means passive subjects. And so I'd like to turn now to the section on what I call um, Rastafari cosmopolitics. And it might be uh, short of time, but I'm going to uh, speak a bit about this section and then move on to the decolonization section. So what's the value of all of this to anthropology? And so I have argued that Rastafari cosmology is a good example of how subordinated peoples envisioned a new way of life uh, and then struggled to achieve it. Um, and imagination features prominently here. This cosmology also was fashioned out of the myriad cultural influences and political economic inequalities of modern capitalism, as I've mentioned, and slavery that propped up plantation production in the new world. So Caribbeanist anthropology and ethnographies of the Caribbean have contributed a great deal to issues of migration, identity, and culture overall within anthropology. And in contrast to stasis as a norm, and presented as such um, in a good deal of research, migration was highly valued, even to the extent of being expected in the Caribbean and its diasporas, long before recent globalizing processes. And although cultural mixing is a common feature of 21st century life in many parts of the world, with the impact of globalization of capital and technology, that of course raises new questions about attachment and belonging, Caribbean peoples have long engaged conceptually, um, socially, politically, experientially with the complexity of their diverse origins, shared practices, and distinctive worldview. So while these concepts that reflect mixing, um, of course, under different conditions and to various degrees, such as creolization, mestizaje, hybridity, um, uh, while these have become um, part of, and also important in postmodern and postcolonial um, critical anthropology, as many anthropologists have highlighted, the use um, has increased the visibility and increased the visibility of these terms. There has at times not been a sufficient attention to the place, both geographic and political and theoretical, sorry, of the Caribbean in social and cultural anthropology. And so the Caribbean has, to a great degree, been peripheral to anthropology, but it has contributed many of the key concepts uh, that anthropologists continue to use. And so this is perhaps another reason why there is value in defending the Caribbean as a kind of expansive area studies. It could not be area studies in a kind of constructed narrow sense. And so... Um, to return to the significance of migration vis-a-vis -vis Jamaican and Rastafari, Jamaica, sorry, and Rastafari, um, from the end of the 19th century, Jamaicans had been one of the largest groups in the Caribbean to move as sources of cheap labor to the United States. And that has not changed um, in the 21st century. Um, and of course, in the post-war period to England and Europe to fill labor deficits. So movement, or more precisely adapting to it, was a core feature in the formation of Rastafari and broadly Caribbean identities. Rastafari, by contrast, rejected migration to England and the West in favor of the riskier move to Ethiopia following the grant of land by Haile Selassie I to quote unquote, uh, black people of the world who wanted to move to Ethiopia in the mid 20th century. And so this is one of the results of the kind of um, political um, negotiations as well, um, that and the anti-colonial movement that Rastafari and other Pan-Africanists and other black radicals undertook um, from the end of the 19th century into the middle of the 20th century, and they continue to undertake today. So I am not suggesting a linear continuity of these processes and ideology, but rather I situate Rastafari migratory and imaginative trajectories within a history of Caribbean internal and external migration. And this historical context matters as well as the disciplinary one. 
Um, I don't need to go into the legacies of ethnographies of closed culture um, in early structural functionist anthropology, for example, and the kinds of postmodern and postcolonial critiques that we've gotten um, that have come from various um, from various uh, spheres and ideologies. So think about, for example, so-called third world anthropologists, um, feminist anthropologists. Um, but one of the things that I do want to note is that Rastafari cosmology cannot be co-opted by the, oh, uh, sorry, this is one of the things also that I wanted to note that in saying all this about a Rastafari lineage of radicalism, um, and reimagination as well. I am not suggesting that Rastafari cosmology cannot be co-opted by the forces it critiques. Um, and so similarly, the influence of Rastafari social action on Jamaican and global popular culture, as well as ethnographic insights have prompted a change of their social status. Uh, while post-colonial Jamaica, largely dependent on tourism, given the erosion of the agricultural production, um, while post-colonial Jamaica has seen Rastafari shift from outcasts to culture bearers, remember the times um, right before decolonization and right after when they were literally hunted, um, as the title of Ennis Enman's book reflects, at the same time, there has been a symbolic appropriation and a hollowing out of Rastafari values for the promotion of brand Jamaica. And whenever we're talking about appropriation, of course, we're also talking about commodification. So the image of, of post-independent Jamaica has been crafted through the cultural attributes and characteristics of reggae, of Bob Marley, of ganja. And elsewhere, hand in hand with the state, the tourism sector cultivates the Western derived tourist gaze of white sand beaches and of course, um, black and brown Caribbean bodies, as well as aquamarine waters that hide to be consumed, but these images hide the slow violence of urban Jamaica that is ongoing. Um, and so I have a couple additional sections, but I think in the, in the interest of time, what I would like to do is continue uh, to talk about Rastafari cosmopolitics, and then I move to the decolonization section. And so I would like to speak uh, specifically about citizenship um, in this section. Um, and so what Rastafari cosmopolitics in 21st century Shoshimane looks like, and um, how does it play out today? So, and given the sacred nature of what Rastafari referred to as a land grant in Shashimani, Caribbean-based Rastafari, as well as Rastafari from various locations in the global north, um, continued to pilgrimage to Shashimani. So it wasn't only those who had, who came from Jamaica um, to Shashimani, who stayed and who settled, many have come and gone and from lots of other places. But these journeys enable Rastafari to update a global community on development in this imagined homeland. But who is mobile and who is less, who's more mobile and who's less mobile, of course, depends on lots of other factors. And this financial and moral support is equally important to the survival, betterment, and the reproduction of Rastafari values in Ethiopia, and by extension, the religious community's identity globally. And so, um, just to give uh, an idea of population, there's of course no, uh, Rastafari are not included in the population in the census, the national census um, of Ethiopia. So estimates range from 500 to 1,000 to 2,000. Um, and so of course, uh, some people say 10,000, but a more reliable estimate would be about 1,000, including of course, those who can be categorized as second and third generation. And so in Shashimani today, it is mostly Rastafari with independent funds who can afford to repatriate. A lack of consistent income and wealth also affects settled, settled sorry, Rastafari there. Um, and many who came from the middle of the 20th century onwards had arrived in Ethiopia with modest funds and then overstayed entrance visas. So this lack of state documentation today limits their international mobility as well as creates a second tier of citizenship that is inherited by the Ethiopian born generations. And there are two Ethiopian born generations today. So for example, second and third generations of undocumented quote unquote residents reflect the material inequalities within global capitalism 
as well as the instabilities in the idea of Africa as home. And precisely because of the premises of actually existing citizenship, the kinds of belonging that Rastafari imagine put them at odds with such institutionalized parameters of belonging. And so what results? You know, precarious positions as undocumented migrants. And so, of course, that doesn't mean that Rastafari have not integrated um, culturally, um, and there hasn't been a great deal of intermarriage and childbearing, but these have not led to legal citizenship. And many Ethiopian-born children in the Jamaica suffer have been denied um, nationality as well as residence, although this situation has recently changed. Um, so in between 2017 and 2018, um, there were residence permits um, that were issued um, to some Rastafari, provided you had a valid passport. How does one get a valid passport if you are an undocumented migrant, quote unquote, and if the, um, the last passport that you had, um, if there is no diplomatic representation, and if you don't have the funds to pay all of the kinds of back um, fees and all of the kinds of fines that you're required to by the government of the country in which you call home. And so for many Rastafari whose passports had expired, this was an insurmountable challenge. And so again, on paper, um, just like the, the granting of the land was a huge, um, was a significant and a very, very important um, political and material step um, to incorporating Rastafari um, and, and those who, who did not consider themselves Rastafari um, into Ethiopia, this actual change um, in policy, in Ethiopian policy, has, has not been able to be, um, many Rastafari have not been able to take advantage of this. And so many still remain undocumented, quote unquote. So one Rastafari woman who had arrived in Shashmani in her 20s, almost 15 years ago, and settled there, um, she had overstayed her tourist visa, explained to me that she had never renewed her passport. Um, since then, Simona explained, machine-readable passports were being issued, but each applicant had to appear in person. And Simona was born in Trinidad and Tobago. And so that's her country, and that's her... The, the country that issues her, her national identity document, but they didn't have an embassy in Ethiopia. And she was unable to leave Ethiopia to apply for the passport and therefore unable to apply for a local identification card. Um, but for those who Rastafari who can afford to apply for passports, this ID card comes with the benefits of Ethiopian residents. And so while in principle, Rastafari can now travel internationally, and for some, this has been immensely important. Um, and having this documentation certainly uh, has meant greater political incorporation into the country. Uh, you can now exit and enter Ethiopia legally. You don't feel as though you are threatened every day that you walk around the place that you call home. But in reality, many Rastafari cannot afford this. And many Rastafari have not been able to take advantage um, of this new um, policy. And so the infrastructure for international mobility remains incomplete, premised on liberal notions of stasis as norm. And so Caribbean Rastafari therefore offer one means to see cosmopolitanism from the South in action. So, there are signs of a worldview emanating from the West Indian experience, its Creole cultural articulations, as well as both anti-colonial and decolonial politics. The expressions of human commonality and community can also provide tools for post-colonial scholars and activists within and outside the Caribbean to critique the forms of nationalism and neoliberalism that subordinate so many. But there are also lessons to be learned um, after these kinds um, of brave uh, actions, right, are taken. And so I would like to uh, wrap up today um, by returning to my central question. Can the ethnographic mindset, uh, this way of thinking, be part of a radical reimagination um, of what life could be like in places of the global south? 
like Jamaica and Ethiopia and the places to which they are connected in the South and the North, if we take categories and if we take classifications that come from the South. And so this question and ones like it have become very important in recent years, as many people, um, as we're well aware, have done considerable work to make decolonization a topic of public concern and also within the discipline of anthropology. But at the same time, we witness many states and state agencies harden their country's borders. And so I had a few um, remarks about the impacts of the conjoined forces of nationalism and neoliberalism, because I am drawing the parallels to what's happening in the post-colonial English-speaking Caribbean um, from my experience in Trinidad and Tobago. And so I'm trying to, I'm going to try to summarize um, but still, because I think these are important points to make in talking about decolonization, the kinds of trajectories um, that are coming from the South and that have come from the South, as well as thinking about solidarity between um, persons and groups across the South and the North. And so, um, uh, okay, so I'm gonna try to condense this slightly. So as I've mentioned, um, although incomplete and not beyond critique, as one example of this, um, of this kind of um, Rastafari reimagination, um, it's the, Paul Gilroy has also aptly called this a counterculture of modernity. And so recognizing the inequalities and the hierarchies um, at the core of modernity, but trying to realize um, the ideals are some of the things that I've talked about and what I've called um, Rastafari cosmopolitics. So um, Caribbean grounded and Rastafari imaginative reinventions have long influenced the evolution of Caribbean ethnography and social theory. So recognizing and building upon this sort of history could help anthropologists to center the very ways of imagining from the South thereby encouraging decolonial ethnography for the 21st century. And I think this is what many anthropologists do in their work. So Caribbean anthropology contributes significantly, I have argued and others have, to a decolonization agenda that refuses both the hegemonic frame of self-referencing and the reordering of discriminatory development. Think about examples of liberal citizenship, um, ideas of mobility and mobility um, and broader and broader things like uh, modernization um, programs, for example, and structural adjustment programs. And so um, what I would like to kind of condense and mention today is that in the post-colonial present, there are still these sorts of um, trajectories and there are still these institutions and experiences of, of various kinds of systemic inequalities, but we are now in the post-colonial era, right? Um, and so a different situation prevails whereby nationalism comes to couch the kind of exploitation and the resulting subordination of colonialism. Um, and so what was quite observable in Trinidad and Tobago over the past two years during hashtag Black Lives Matter um, was the public demand to remove statues of white colonizers specifically. And these are clear symbols of racial capitalism and clear symbols of the kinds of, of, of the colonial history, right? Um, but also the making of this unequal modernity on this side or on the other side of the Atlantic, because I'm on the other side. But what was noticeable in the calls to remove statues of white colonizers was that there were very few calls to examine the role of Caribbean tax havens uh, in, for example, in maintaining the global racial wealth gap. Or there were very few calls to establish more worker cooperatives of major industries or generally to pursue wealth distribution. And so for nationalists, even pointing out how the multi-ethnic black and brown Caribbean elite willingly adhere to a project of whiteness as domination and exploitation is resisted. And so calling for decolonization today is often equated with a failure of nationalism. And such a framing impacts research agendas, um, funding, as well as the value attached to scholarship. 
So this is certainly, this is uh, my argument, um, and many people um, will have a different take on this. Um, but given post-colonial reclamation as part of decolonization movements in the Anglophone Caribbean, and necessarily so, um, the local is now presently studied and taught in a very narrow sense. It is not the expansive area studies that incorporated the global of, that was at the core of Caribbean anthropology. So the frame of reference to what is valuable and authentically quote unquote Caribbean or Trinidadian or Tobagonian is very narrowly local. And this is antithetical, I argue, to the everyday realities and histories of the Caribbean and its peoples. And this is also demonstrated in ethnographies of the Caribbean. So there is value, I see, um, in this and ethnographies of this sort, of decolonial ethnographies of the sort that also grapple with the kinds of post-colonial framings um, that are at work as well in many parts of the global south. And so I have a few other points um, that I will skip, but one of the things that I wanted to end with also was to say that um, these sorts of endeavors of doing this kind of decolonial work doesn't need to be confined to scholars or intellectual historians. An ethnographic mindset can help us here in reaching public audiences as well, recognizing that these two lines of argument, I had mentioned um, previously in my notes, that oftentimes what happens at the university is that students are encouraged to be practical when you're studying, when you're choosing a research topic, when you're choosing subject matter, and to, to be practical and to think locally. Um, and so a lot of that has to do with constraints of funding, of course, that we're well aware of, um, and these sorts of inequalities within global academia and the regions and educational institutions, but the idea that there is nothing valuable outside of the local, um, and how the local comes to be narrowly defined in Trinidad and Tobago, I think, is one of the problems and one of the, the concerns, one of the great concerns that I have at the moment. So these sorts of endeavors do not need to be confined, as I mentioned, to scholars or intellectual historians. And so this ethnographic mindset can have us here in reaching public audiences as well, recognizing that these two lines of argument be practical, and at the same time, neglect the big picture, feed off of each other. And so these are these kinds of framings are at work in both the global north and the global south um, in different contexts and to different degrees. So I, to sum, I have summarized these points around decolonization, um, doing ethnography and Anglophone Caribbean academia to say that arguing in favor of an ethnographic mindset is difficult, as many anthropologists know today. Um, and it is particularly difficult in these present times, especially if we're thinking about an ethnographic um, mindset within the marketization of the university, the commodification of higher education, and the all round neoliberal and nationalist grammars that have come to shape the university, public reasoning, and social life more broadly, where we take quantitative measures or quantitative measures are taken as the primary methods of assessing outputs, their value to scholarly and public audiences, and the value of people, right, and the value of life more broadly. But it is critique of the sort that helps us to recognize the liberatory prospects of an ethnographic mindset. And so to end, finally, because I've said this maybe twice, but um, anthropology and ethnography have a great deal to contribute in doing the hard work of universal human emancipation, just as that hard work has been done by Rastafari and has been done by Haitian surrectionists or those in um, Saint-Domingue in the 19th century. Um, and so rather than thinking that is bounded by nationalism and development categories, which tend to dominate in institutions of the South, and I'm talking specifically um, from my experience in the Caribbean and urban Ethiopia, so the latter I didn't have too much time to get, I didn't have much time to get into, um, but I did teach in Ethiopia at a public university for three years. So what I hope to have highlighted 
um, from some of these remarks and from my ethnographic work in particular with Rastafari is how Rastafari have shifted the locus of worldviews from Europe to Africa. In positioning Ethiopia as a spiritual birthplace of humanity, Rastafari engage in ontological and epistemological reinvention. And of course, these are also teleological questions. And like Rastafari, instead of avoiding critiques of the hierarchies and intricacies of post-colonial academia, recognizing how nationalism and liberalism are functioning and neoliberalism as well, are functioning in tandem with the same results are useful for anthropologists within and outside the academy in the South as well as in the North. And so this is where I think the ethnographic mindset um, can help us. So thank you very much. And I will finally end here today. Thank you. Okay, please, if you have any questions or comments uh, for Charlene, now is the time. You have, uh, Anastasia, with the microphone. Uh, people on Zoom, can you hear? Uh-oh, I may not have been using the microphone. Can they hear? I may not have been using the microphone, but hopefully they heard. Yes, it's, it's okay. I think um, Heidi has a question. Okay, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I just wanted to hear a little bit about uh, gender in, in terms of Rastafari reimagining some politics. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, thank you. So shall I take uh, one question and another? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, yeah, and so I think this is one of the limitations um, of this kind of Rastafari reimagination, right, of personhood um, and of, an, of, of a self um, that is equal and realizing these kinds of, um, realizing the, the kinds of equality that had not been realized, right, on both sides of the Atlantic, because women are still very much um, uh, inferior. And so within um, Rastafari worldview, certainly there are still these hierarchies that are reproduced. Um, and they are reproduced out of um, the kinds of structures that have existed um, within colonialism, but they are also now reproduced as well in Shashmani as well. Um, and there are Rastafari women, as I'm, I'm sure you will know, who are, as they say, um, writing back against Rastafari patriarchy. So the kinds of, these are also the sorts of intricacies and hierarchies that I think are important for us um, to, to grapple with, right? And to recognize so that when there are two things uh, in the present moment whereby Rastafari becomes, uh, worldview and in particular becomes idealized. So one uh, is, is the kind of narrow sense of a, a narrow black nationalism, and the other is the kind of um, commodification, right, of Rastafari. And those two elide the kinds of hierarchies and those kinds of internal um, intricacies that are still present and that many um, are still grappling with today. And so it is also the work that Rastafari women have been doing and Rasta women themselves to challenge that kind of patriarchy that is ongoing, that I, I didn't speak about today. But yes, uh, it's precisely those kinds of, um, those kinds of inequalities reproduced that are often also elided. Okay, thank you. Hey, thank you for the great presentation. It was really a pleasure to hear it since I've also done some research on Rasta and reggae music, both in Finland and in South Africa. And I would like uh, to ask, how do you see on. the, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I would like to ask how you see the future of the movement now, because when I discussed with some younger Rastas, they, there's this kind of tension that some see that the movement is somehow losing this kind of radical potential and becoming a little bit more conservative and traditionalist looking back. So yeah, that's that's my question. Thank you, Thomas. Um, 
I don't know. So one of the things I don't know if it's um, uh, I use the term Rastafari as a, a, a social movement, right? And as a political movement, I don't know if it's a, um, uh, it is an anti-colonial and a decolonial um, framework that guides Rastafari, but I don't know if it's a, a, a movement per se in the sense that um, there are lots of these, there are lots of, of um, uh, groups Right, um, who have different agendas, but one of the things that I that I draw upon analytically is that kind of anti-colonial um, and decolonial core, um, and so there is a great deal of internal differentiation that Rastafari recognize themselves of people around the world, but that also exists um, in the structures and the organizing and simply in opinions, right. Um, and also in beliefs that people have um, who consider and who identify as Rastafari. Um, and so my work focuses more so upon those who look to spiritual repatriation as a way of realizing um, emancipation. And there are also many Rastafari who think this is an escapist, right? Um, uh, an escapist sort of action. Um, and they think that uh, it's actually wrong. Um, and so I don't know if I can um, think about the future of a movement, but, but one of the things that I do look to um, and I do see hope in, um, both in terms of ethnography, but also both, so dis the discipline, but also personally, is that kind of, um, kind of anti-colonial and decolonial core. Um, to the thinking. And so at the same time, as I've mentioned already, many Rastafari are, are very complicit in the, the kind of commodification, right, of social life um, and of the iconography of Rastafari. So this might be a rather unsatisfactory <laughs> answer um, and unsatisfying, but uh, I hope we have some time to talk about it a bit more. Um, but what I have found in my work recently um, in Shashamani is that that kind of anti-colonial and decolonial um, thought is there. And it is reproduced in second and third generations and those, among people who consider themselves and who identify as Rastafari. And so I leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, should we also check on Zoom in if uh, there are questions on Zoom in Are there in any comments on Zoom? Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for the lecture. It was really interesting. Uh, I just, uh, you mentioned how the tourism kind of shapes the image of Jamaica. So I was kind of like thinking um, how the Rastafaris feel about this tourism, this Bob Mali culture, that's kind of like image that is pretty much in the minds of uh, and, and in terms of white people. How does they feel about it? Is it like stereotypic or how, how do they feel about it? And so um, a, a good deal of my ethnographic work has been done with Rastafari in Ethiopia. Um, and less so uh, in Jamaica. I actually haven't done any ethnography in Jamaica. It's just been to, you know, um, to, to, to visit and to, um, so it, that is an ethnography um, of sort outside of the, the, the traditional sense of ethnography that we'll talk more about this afternoon. Um, but uh, in, with Rastafari in Ethiopia, because they have that geographical distance, they, and that's one reason, they are very, very critical of it. Um, and so one of the things also that I think is important for us to recognize is that the project of um, white supremacy isn't, uh, this is a horrible way to phrase it, but it is, there are components of that in terms of economic exploitation, in terms of the entrenchment of neoliberal policies, in terms of the entrenchment of development categories into thinking within academia that's reproduced in the post-colonial 
um, present. So post-colonial countries and states are very complicit, um, certainly in the English-speaking Caribbean with that project. And, and so from the vantage of, from the vantage point of Rastafari in Shashamani, they are very, very critical of this kind of um, commodification of Rastafari iconography, that kind of exploitation of the Rastafari body. But on the other hand, they also look to music very much um, as a way of spreading the message of Rastafari. And so there are also many Rastafari youth who are, um, and Tomas may know a great deal more about this, across um, Southern uh, Africa and Ethiopia, who are amateur musicians and who are trying to make it um, as professional musicians. And so um, they do recognize that music has been very, very influential in also uh, spreading that message so that it is not only those in the Caribbean, but white Rastafari, Europeans, um, those who are not only in the South to manifest Rastafari. And so I would only be able to speak about um, um, from the view of those in Shashamani. And certainly in Jamaica, of course, there are varying, um, there are varying viewpoints um, depending on what, depending on, on power and what position you occupy and positionality, of course. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, do I need to press something else? Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the very interesting talk. Uh, and uh, this is a bit of an empirical question. Uh, I wanted to, if you could say a bit more about the relationship or connection between pan Africanism and Rastafarian uh, cosmopolitics. And I'm thinking in particular, uh, Faye Harrison's work and the, the kind of 1991 edited volume that she edited with this uh, decolonizing generation and uh, how they talked about that from pan-Africanism the idea of di diaspora uh, really emerged as a as a movement uh, as something that is produced by movement but also creating uh, the movement and I guess uh, on, on my very limited understanding the uh, pan-Africanism is very much a political movement and uh, Rastafarian cosmopolitics also has the uh, some religious uh, connotations, and the, so could you just talk about this a bit more—the relationship between the two? Yes, sure. Um, and so there are. Um, this is, of course, again from ethnographic work in Shashamani, and um, many Rastafari will say they are not political, and so. Um, they will argue that there is a, a Pan-African lineage of recognizing these, the kinds of, um, the kinds of oppression that has ordered the, the modern world um, and the kinds of ways in which there are similar experiences that um, out of this, this ordering of the modern world, um, and, but there is also this, this, again, this sort of internal differentiation um, between the Pan-Africanist with the uppercase, um, the P and the A, right, the movement um, that was ostensibly political, that was introduced um, with the Pan-Africanist Congresses um, from the 1900s onwards, um, and the kind of everyday Pan-Africanism that I, I have argued is observable in Rastafari cosmopolitics precisely because they are challenging political and they're challenging political and social institutions, right? Um, precisely through, um, or we can think about categories of citizenship, um, but that kind of tension between the official, the, the Pan-Africanist with the uppercase and the Pan-African, um, Pan-Africanism and the everyday sort of Pan-Africanism that sees connections um, between uh, or among people who have had these collective histories of subordination and oppression is another kind of um, tension that I think is, is worthwhile to note. And so 
the kind of anti-colonial and decolonial um, project of Rastafari is a project that uh, is characterized by an everyday Pan-Africanism and that is sometimes also in, ten in, in tension with the uppercase, the political Pan-African, precisely because there is this reference to um, Rastafari cosmology, there is this the spiritual and the religious components um, that are not included, right, in the Pan-African with the uppercase P and the A. And so um, that's one of the tensions that I have not looked at necessarily um, in my work, but I think um, one of the ways that we can uh, recognize the commonalities while also being attentive to these sorts of tensions uh, is precisely in thinking about this point that you've made about diaspora. So there's a Black experience that uh, transcends persons who are ostensibly Black, right? And that's, I think, um, something that is also, again, some Rastafari agree and some Rastafari don't. So just as the project of whiteness is something that is, um, I have argued is reproduced today um, in the post in post-colonial countries, the Black experience is very specific, um, but it is also uh, a, a set of historically contingent um, conditions and the resulting experiences of it that many people can associate with today. So I think I leave it here for now because it's a long-winded way of saying again, these kinds of commonalities and ambiguities and tensions are kind of all wrapped up um, in Rastafari cosmopolitics, Pan-Africanism with the uppercase P and the A, and then the everyday sort of Pan-Africanism, or the little Pan-Africanism. And of course, we will talk more. There was a question from Henny, but first let's check out the question uh, in the chat. So, says, uh, thank you for a very encouraging presentation. Taking Malinowski as an example, a white privileged scholar with means to live without ordinary work and pay for research. How do we escape the colonial bias to what is essentially expensive research? <laughs> that is in who does the ethnographical research, the awareness of the local and the academic community we communicate to. So okay, thank do you, you want to? How do answer? we escape the colonial bias um, to what is essentially expensive research? Right, um, yeah. And so the first thing is to recognize, yes, precisely that that colonial bias is still is um, is present um, in many spaces and not um, uh, just in the north. Um, and then the second thing would be to look to some of the things that we will be talking a bit about this afternoon and um, also tomorrow when we think about the one thing is um, the idea that to do proper ethnography, you must be there, right? For at least, you must be there for at least a season. Um, you must be there for years. Um, and to do that's to do good ethnography um, and proper ethnography, and that's the only way to do that. And um, so to look to things like patchwork ethnography, for example, um, and recognizing that there are lots of other sorts of invisible labors um, and lots of other uh, demands right made on people as they're doing this um, so-called good and proper ethnography. And the second thing would be also to look to uh, um, a public imagination, if you want to call it that. Um, and so in another paper, I've looked at anthropology as public citizenship, because one of the ways that I found um, of of sharing the value of anthropology and ethnography with students uh, in a university where there is no anthropology major and there is no anthropology program per se, is to recognize that a lot of the, the kinds of tools that the ethnographic mindset asks us um, 
to, to, to think about and to use is precisely because it allows us to question the kind to question the kinds of hierarchies um, that exist, right? And so to think about doing, um, if you want to call it public anthropology, um, or if you want to call it anthropology as public citizenship, um, or if you want to call it um, encouraging this ethnographic mindset across disciplines and within um, students who are not necessarily um, doing anthropology completely is the way that I would start <laughs> answering that for now. Okay. So, Henry, please, uh, Anastasia, can you bring the microphone? And I think it might be our last question, uh, depending on your answer. I'll we try might and have make time it. Time for a quick one uh, after Henry's. Let's see. Okay. Thank you, Shaleen, for the presentation. Um, my question is is a bit all over the place, so I'll but I'll try and <laughs> rein it together. And and it's not so much a question as a request for you to reflect on this. Um, I was really struck by by how you spoke of the emancipatory potential of the ethnographic mindset. And then on the other hand, about how you spoke about the way in which students and correct me if I, I understood this wrong, but I was somehow really surprised. You said that that students are being given in um, encouraged to be practical and to neglect the big picture, which somehow to me just seems very different to what I encourage my students to do. But but these two things somehow put together strike me as interesting because I don't know, maybe I'm in the wrong Twitter spaces, but the kind of discussion I hear most at the moment about the ethnographic mindset is that it needs to be gotten rid of because there is no emancipatory potential because it is so fundamentally racist and and white supremacist and all of these things. And specifically speaking in the context of, I don't know if you've been following the recent outrage around uh, an article in the African, um, African Studies Review that was published, which was this clear attempt by two white scholars to gesture towards decolonization and uh, decolonizing autoethnography and a thousand mainly African scholars said this is ridiculous and the reason for their critique was repeatedly that the problem with African studies is that it's based in anthropology and we need a moratorium on both. So somehow there's all this conversation around anthropology and then here I hear you speak about the emancipatory potential of the ethnographic mindset. So I'd just like to hear your thoughts on these very two different sort of discussions which seem to be taking place simultaneously and somehow in tension sometimes with each other. Yes, thank and I think, and thank you, Annie. And, and I think um, those and these conversations and these debates are ongoing. Um, precisely, mainly, uh, so I'm not familiar with this particular debate, so we can talk about that one, um, the one African Studies Review. Um, but um, certainly in the North, um, and so, of course, these also these debates and these discussions are ongoing in the South. Um, but the the context and the kinds of contextualization in the North are also quite significantly different from that of the South. While, of course, um, you know, influencing each other um, to very and very asymmetrical ways. And so, one of the things, just to clarify, that I mentioned is that many students are encouraged, certainly at this university, um, to think practically. Um, and to choose research um, topics that are practical. Um, and, the, and these are, uh, of course, because of reasons of, of limited funding, right, primarily. Um, but it's also to make suggestions that are practical. So suggestions that fit within particular development categories. So uh, at the expense of the abstract, at the expense of the theoretical, to be very um, empirical, to be very micro level, to be very practical. And that's not, and that's generally the trend precisely because there's, this, there's, a, there's a huge focus um, on, again, uh, development. Right. And so what's going to happen, the reason why you're doing research and you're at the university is to help the country. 
Um, and so, and this is largely, that doesn't mean this, just because this is the, the dominant discourse, it doesn't mean that there aren't other ideas um, that are there. And so one of the things that um, I see as the emancipatory potential of the ethnographic mindset is precisely why I've drawn upon Caribbean anthropology, because it is, it is very, um, um, it is both very interesting and very odd um, from my vantage that the university was a place of, of, of great emancipatory potential, certainly the public university in the English speaking Caribbean. Um, and that has changed to a different degree over the decades, but it's precisely because um, Caribbeanists, uh, both anthropologists, social historians, intellectuals, and public intellectuals were able to recognize um, that the Caribbean could have never fit into um, that kind of, the kind of framing of the native. And that's one of the reason um, that that kind of framing of the native that was so critical to the discipline of anthropology, right, um, for a good century and a half or longer. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why the Caribbean has been uh, the subject matter has kind of come late to anthropology, right? It's really only from the middle of the 20th century that ethnography has been done in the Caribbean, but it could not have been ethnography that was done in the same way of, for example, um, the newer, right, of the 1940s, for example. So it, it wasn't, and it simply could not have been that same sort of, um, uh, that same sort of fitting into uh, the savage and the native. And so along with that went along certain institutions um, in the post-colonial English speaking Caribbean that again were meant to promote this sort of radical agenda, which has changed of course since then with ver for various reasons. Um, and so that's why I still talk about the emancipatory potential of the, of the ethnographic mindset from a vantage point of Caribbean anthropology and to, and to, to ask us to reconsider, uh, just as many have done this kind of critiques of area studies, that the area studies of the Caribbean could never have been, it, it wasn't um, um, the area studies in the very narrow sense, right, of urban anthropology, for example. Um, and so that's where I still see uh, the, those between those those kinds of junctures, um, Caribbeanist anthropology, ethnographies of the Caribbean, um, the institution of the public university in the English speaking Caribbean, um, and that emancipatory potential. Those are the kind of the ways that I've, I've created that kind of linkage that I think makes sense um, in that particular context that doesn't make sense in the North. In, in the same way. So I leave it there for now, and we can always talk more later. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, audience, for your good <laughs> questions and, and comments. And more importantly, thank you, Shalene, for your elaborations. And uh, let's give Shalene a big hand once more for her.